He's been making sense of science for us for 40 years. And every year, he takes your questions. And I love questions like this, where you look at something in everyday life and you say, you know, like, why is it like that? That's how science works. Questions like, what has science learned from those that have suffered a near-death experience? Want to know the answer? Well, we sat down with CBC's science correspondent and host of Quirks and Quarks, Bob McDonald, for a special two-part one-on-one. And tonight, here's a special preview. So let's get some answers. Round two for 2017. <laughs> and sadly, you know, kind of the last one for me. Yeah, the, yeah. One-on-one. Uh, We've been doing this for how many years now? Uh, quite a few. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And... Uh, Always so enjoyable to uh, to do this with you, yeah, and I know people love it. I'm gonna um, miss it, Peter. Here we go. First question for uh, the, this final session. Keith Nile from Toronto. There are stars that appear yellow, red, white, and even blue. Why aren't there any bright green stars? Now, I'll be honest. I I, I don't know. It must be my eyes. I can never. I never saw, all I ever see is white stars. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, well, in the wintertime, if, uh, if you look at the famous constellation Orion, it's the big square with the three in the middle. Uh, there's, a, there's a star up on its shoulder called Betelgeuse that's definitely red if you look at it. And then down by his feet, there's the dog this star is, is this Sirius. with the naked eye? Or yep, yep, be, yep, yeah. yep, yep. With naked eye, you'll see it's got an orange tint to it. And then Sirius, the dog star down by his feet, is, is blue-white. And those are two different kinds of stars. Stars are all basically made of the same stuff. They're made of hydrogen and helium, but they're different temperatures. So if you see a red star, it's cool. The temperature on the surface only about 2,500 degrees. <laughs> it's still pretty hot by our standards, yeah. but, but that's cool. Our sun is uh, called the yellow star, so it's about 6,000 degrees. It's hotter. And then the, the blue stars, they're getting up around 15,000. And then you get into really hot white stars, and there are actually green stars, and they're 50,000 degrees. They can be up to 50,000 degrees on the surface. We don't see very many of them because they live fast and die young. Mm. <laughs> they don't last long. They just burn themselves out. Only so, the good ones do that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, re there were more green stars at the beginning, but uh, not too many now. When we do see them, they don't last very long, but they do exist. All right, video from Catherine Burr from London, Ontario. If I cut or scrape my skin, what is the process the body uses to heal itself and repair? Uh, how did the two sides of the cut come together so the cut disappears? And uh, if I put a Band-Aid on it, will it heal faster? This, this is a fascinating process. There's actually four stages involved in this. So there are these specialized skin cells that go to the site of the wound, and they start to populate either side of it. And they just grow like crazy. They just grow like mad. And as they, they reach out to each other across the room, they touch, and they produce collagen. So collagen is in your skin. It's what gives your skin its strength. It's what you lose when you get really old and your skin starts hanging on your face. You know, it looks really thin. That's loss of collagen. So they make collagen, and collagen is very fibrous. And these fibers reach out to each other, and they hook like this, and then they shrink, and they actually draw together like this. And they draw the sides of the wound together. And then they fill in that space. And then they cover it over with another layer on top. So there are four stages to populate, get the collagen, pull it together, and, and heal over the top. The thing is that when it's done, these skin cells are not like regular skin cells. They don't have pigment, so they don't turn dark, and they don't have hair. So you gotta be really careful with your scars in the sun. I don't know if you, if you have a scar and you, you get a sunburn, the scar will stay pink. And so they're, they're more susceptible, but it's an incredible process of our skin healing itself. That probably explains the scars on my head. Yeah, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the tape? What about oh, if you oh, use yes. a Band-Aid? Well, the Band-Aid is mostly to keep germs out. Uh, is, is to keep bacteria and everything out from the outside. That's, that's mostly what it is, is keep the dirt out. It doesn't really speed the healing. In fact, oftentimes it's better to leave it open if you're in a clean environment. So. Stitching. It, Stitching it, is bringing the wound together so there's less, so that the cells have farther to, to reach, right? It's just trying to close the wound to let those healing cells get in contact with you and draw that collagen together. So it's an aid to the cells. Yep. Jim Miller from Richmond, BC. Uh, has this question uh, on video. What has science learned from those that have suffered a near-death experience? Perhaps it's something to do with memory storage and replay, or possibly even something from the realm of spirituality. 
Well, I can answer this question from a personal point of view because uh, earlier this year, uh, my brother, who's extremely physically fit, he was on a bicycle uh, race, a long ride to, to raise funds, and he had a heart attack and he died on the side of the road and they brought him back thanks to paramedics that were there on the scene, but his heart had stopped for many minutes and they had to put him into a cold coma for a while before he could come back to consciousness. What, what does that mean? Um, they lowered the temperature of the body to, uh, to allow, to give the heart a rest. So they actually cooled him down. They're so he doing was in that a right coma. on the side of the road? Or? No, they did it in the hospital, once oh. they got him to the hospital, right? And it took him months to recover from that. Uh, he's back, he's great. You know, he's back on his bicycle again. But I went to see him while he was there, and he was totally out of it. Um, and even when he started coming back into consciousness, I was talking to him. I thought he was responding. I've talked to him since about that. I said, so what do you remember? What do you remember? He says, all I remember is riding along, and then there were these two girls riding in front of me, and they were going really fast. And I would say, why are they going so fast? I'm usually passing them. But he was slowing down. And he said, and all I remember was just kind of nodding my head, and that's it. He has no recollection of the event. He has no going to the light experience. Um, and his, his short-term memory around that was affected, but his long-term memory is not, and he's back. So it didn't change his spirituality, but what it did change is his appreciation for life. Mm. He loves life, and he has no tolerance for people who complain. So there's a case of someone who sort of died and come back, and when he left the hospital, they, they said, welcome back. <laughs> they didn't say goodbye. They said, welcome back. So I, you know... Uh, it's His appreciation for first yeah, responders too. Absolutely. Gone absolutely. How absolutely. long? How long was he out? I mean, if they got it, they had to take him to a hospital. We're, yeah. We're talking... Well, they, it took a while. Fortunately, there were other paramedics that had the paddles on their oh, bicycles, okay. so there there are right. paramedics that ride with him. The so the first again. one to to get there, he right. was on him right away with the CPR. Actually, right. broke a couple of ribs to try to keep the heart going, right. and then they get the paddles on to try to stabilize the heart because the heart fibrillates like this, yeah. and um, and then they get it stabilized. But he was. Um, Good 15 don't, minutes people don't realize like how hard you have to yeah. push. Yeah. Like yeah. breaking ribs is. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to intentionally break ribs, but yeah. it's uh, you know it, to, to keep it, it going. You got to push hard. Do that. Um, great news that he's uh, back yeah, and with he's back. us. Okay. Anna Lane of uh, Ottawa. My nose runs when the weather is cold. It also runs when I eat hot food. Why are my sinuses so affected by both extremes? of temperatures. Yeah, well, we sneeze because of irritants in, that get into our nose, whether it's dust or pollen or whatever. And it's the body saying, look, I, I don't want this. The nose is a filter. That's why it's got mucus in it to stop stuff from getting into our lungs and into our, our nasal passage. So if there's something there that irritates it, you sneeze to get it out. Just get it out. And it's, it's you know, you use more muscles. You use almost every muscle in your body to sneeze. There's only one other activity that we do that uses more muscles. And so and you, we, we try to get. You're not going to explain what that is. Sex. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I just wanted to hear you say that. <laughs> and this is our last show, right? Yeah. So, but you use everything. Your body wants everything to get get rid of that. Well, it turns out that cold is also an irritant. Cold air is an irritant to your nose because it it's, it feels funny when it goes in, and so can heat. So it's just your body responding the same way as it would to pollen. An irritant in your nose that you want to get rid of. We don't like to be cold. <laughs> That's our time. Wow. Been another uh, great one. I'll, I'll miss these uh, for a lot yeah. of reasons, but I learned so much from them, and I know our viewers do too. And yeah. I may be going, but Bob's not. So well, uh, I, I got to tell one. you, Peter, it's been a real pleasure doing these with you. It's fun, yeah. and I should mention we don't rehearse these. Okay, no. there's, there's no <laughs> rehearsal, and we don't rehearse on the national either. We just no. throw those straight up, and it's yeah. just it's just such a joy working with you. You listen, you feedback, yeah. and it's just been great. And I'm going to be you. totally transparent. You, you do get a sense of what the questions are, yeah, yeah, of course, sure. so you can. Yeah. Do a little bit of research, um, and uh, but it's oh, very natural between no, no uh, between you and I. <laughs> Thanks again, Peter. It's been great. Thanks. Great.